This is Susan Pitcairn. Since the early 1980s, I've worked with my husband, Richard, on many aspects of veterinary care and holistic treatment for dogs and cats, especially working on the dietary issues. In 2015, I finally came out of the closet and gave a speech to the many colleagues and veterinary friends that we developed through the years as we changed course and decided it was time to talk about vegan diets for dogs, cats, and ourselves. Welcome everybody. I just wanted to let you know, this is a work in progress. It, it took longer than I thought. It's taken several hundred hours to put this together. And I was working till late last night, working on this till this morning, working before breakfast. So it's a work in progress. Some of it explores new ground, especially the part with pets, and much of it doesn't. Some of it may be familiar information and some not. But basically, I wanted to tell you a little bit what happened to Richard and I that we made a change in our lives. We've been vegetarians for about 45 years with Especially me, I've kind of gone, you know, I've had occasional meat a little bit here and there and some fish and, you know, Thanksgiving and those things, buffets. And we were eating a lot of cheese. Okay, I would just say a lot of cheese. Tried a few times to become vegan for, mostly for, I guess, for ethical or health reasons and didn't last very long. The cheese was addictive. Last fall, it, we were having a kind of a potluck group for gardeners, basically, and somebody in sustainability and somebody suggested we watch this movie. And this movie changed our lives, and we're going to show it tonight. It may not change your life, and, but it, anyway, it's a good movie. <laughs> really well done. And it's about the sustainability issues with animal products, basically, and why we don't know more about it, because it is the number one environmental problem that we can do something about. So, I mean, your voting doesn't really mean much, right? But you can vote with your wallet three times a day, and the overall impact of it is huge. So, we'll go on with that. And then Richard has a little bit to say also about he, what he sees the you know, leadership role, perhaps, amongst veterinarians. Well, just briefly, uh, just giving my perspective on it. He's coming with our own perspective on, on these issues, you know. And I will talk more about that tomorrow, Saturday, when I talk about the psychological aspect of treating cancer and other problems that are challenging to us. I'd like to go into that more depth. <laughs> Uh, kind of, for those of you who came sort of in the direction that I did with your own. Um, so I, I have felt, you know, for some time that uh, somehow I wanted to understand more why we aren't able to relieve suffering more effectively, and why we can't progress more in our understanding. What came up for me at one point when I was sort of pondering this and meditating on it was that we have to redefine the profession. You know, it's easy to say. But redefine the profession, what we need to do is orient ourselves that our purpose, as Hahnemann says, is to cure, to relieve suffering. And that we have no other purpose as veterinarians and as healers. And that means we have to take care of and care for, really care for all animals. We can't split our mind into caring for dogs and cats or horses and not caring about livestock and not caring about chickens and not caring about fish. This is what came up for me. We, to progress further and understand, and this, this is directed to me, I'm not saying you have to do this, I think this way, but for me, I understood that what I have to do to go further and become more effective is I have to have a mind that's unified towards compassion for all things. So that's where I come into this. And I think it's very important, and Susan, as you said, has put last several months put her art career on hold and worked full time. Literally, I get up in the morning and she's been up since five working on this stuff for months. What I would like to suggest to you is just simply open your mind, let it come into your awareness, just ponder it, and just at least consider it, look at it, uh, and, and think about it. And that's really what we want to do. What, what we're basically going to do is to present some things that are in our face. By the year 2040, uh, and that's only since like 1990. Like, I will be like 91 then if I'm alive. Some of you that are younger will probably only be in your 70s. You'll still be cook cooking. We're going to have some very serious problems in the world if we continue on the path we're on. 
I'll, well, show you, let's look at it here. It's broken into three parts, basically, the sustainability, the health, and the humane aspects, and then we'll go into the, the recommendations and diets. So we'll start with sustainability. It's, I see it as an imperative. It's an ethical issue, and it's a survival and health issue. If we don't have a planet, we can't be healthy, for sure. If we have an unhealthy planet that's struggling along, we also can't be healthy. So the first issue let's look at is water. Uh, right now, about 25% of humans are depleting the aquifers that they have locally, that they're going down faster than they can recharge. I'm sure that's happening in Arizona, and certainly in California. California recently uh, had only got like 18% of its normal snowpack last, last winter. And it's, the, you know, it's the produce basket of the nation. Climate change, we went to a talk by a, a, climate, a meteorologist. He said, you know, we're likely to get warming for sure. And with warming, we don't really know. It's 50-50 whether we're going to get more wet or more dry. Very good chance it's going to be more dry. And most fresh water goes where? It's not down the toilet. It's not for the longer shower. It's not for any of that that we've been told we've got to do. It's for animal agriculture. This is California. We used to live, this is the Almaden Reservoir near Santa Cruz. It's down to nothing. This used to be full when we lived there all the time. Okay, so we thought, let's do something, you know? We live here in the Arizona. This is my little dream, see? <laughs> so so we, we did the baths and flushes. We did, we did laundry to, to let landscape kind of work up. So we dump our gray water out in our orchard. And we even stalled rain tanks. We didn't do real super big ones because we do have a view to look at, you know? So, <laughs> so yeah, that was like, that was very cool, we thought. So, woohoo! <laughs> but then... You know, I put things in perspective. This is how much one American uses every day, 156 gallons, for domestic use. This isn't even agriculture, okay? <laughs> Europeans down here, Asians down here, Africans way down here, which is really just basically two of these five-gallon buckets. And then the, the World Health Organization's minimum to survive basically is 13 or to be decently healthy. Okay, so... Interesting. That's just one person. Woohoo! So then we learn how to really save water after watching Cowspiracy. Just eat plants. It takes only 1% of the water to produce the same amount of protein from grain as from animal products. And the aquifer in the, under the Great Plains has been left over from the ice ages and the melting of the glaciers. It had a huge amount of water in it, and it's going to come to an end. Production of beef draws more from it than all fruit and vegetables combined. And I also heard recently that if we stopped drawing water from there and just let nature take its course, it would be about 6,000 years for it to fill again. Okay, here's a, just a little bit more detailed example. Say like potatoes. Potatoes are kind of a key item because... They are one thing we could grow and live on. And the UN, as I sh will show you, has declared them plant of the year, basically. And they have enough protein and enough vitamin C to, to live on. Okay, beef, look at this. 1,847 gallons per pound. Potato is 34. Some, some estimates on beef I've seen has been as high as 2,500, but I wanted to be conservative about it. And uh, cheese, 665. Rice, 299, even though it's like got water patties and all that. Um, chickens, you know, not as bad, obviously, or pork as, as beef. And I don't know why all the reasons, but I mean, it involves things like washing out their pens, you know, growing the crops that they, they are eating and processing them at the slaughterhouse and all that stuff. Tofu is up there a little bit, but you, know, so you can see all the grains here are pretty, pretty low, and the produce especially. Nuts are generally kind of high. I think I might have seen a 1,000 on almonds somewhere else, <laughs> something like that. If you do the nuts that are more drought tolerant, I guess that would be better. But the good news is every day that you eat plant-based, you save 1,100 gallons of water per person. per person. In the Verde Valley where we live, we use about 3,000 gallons a month per person, domestic use. So we're saving a third of our domestic use in one day. And in terms of my rain tanks here, okay, <laughs> for the two of us, it's like more than 10 rain tanks in one day we save simply by not having meat, eggs, and dairy in our diet. And it's tasty and, it, and it's healthy. So, I, you know, it's like, wow, cool. How cool is that? What a wonderful gift. Now, let's look at deforestation. Deforestation is a more serious problem than I realized. We looked at Cowspiracy, the, one of the main 
people that she's one of the only ones that would really finally speak honestly about it. And she said that we could lose the Amazon in 10 years at the rate that it's going. And that, that activists who have stood up against it, 1,100 of them have been murdered, basically by the animal agriculture industry. Some friends we have in Ecuador just mentioned another Ecuadorian activist that was killed. This is causing 137 species a day in rainforests alone to go extinct forever, ones that were here for millions of years. And it's causing the largest mass extinction since the time of the dinosaurs, which is mass extinction number six in terms of geological history. The good news about this, and I've done some reading on this, is that if we all go extinct, the Earth will probably survive. There has been times when, for 25 million years, the whole Earth was locked in ice. And everything died except for maybe a few bacteria at the equators. And it came back when the volcanoes broke through the ice. I'd really rather not have that happen. I'd really rather, wouldn't you? I mean, look at all the time it took to get here where we are. So, <laughs> and there's so much beauty. But we're just chopping it away. This year 2040 seems to be something that a lot of people are, are in different areas are talking about. But because of the loss of the rainforest, we'll have large droughts. And I should think we'd also have some effects on the oxygen level, since they're the lungs of the earth, and the extinction of maybe half of the world's species. Now, this is an interesting thing I learned in the last few months. We've been watching lots of videos and reading books and stuff. Once free-living animals, wild animals, we could say, were 98% of the Earth's animal biomass, and, we were, and our animals were 2%. This would have to be within the last 10,000 years that we only had domestic animals. Now it's the other way around. We are 98% of the biomass on Earth. Now, some might think that's a good idea. It's better to be a human being you know, than to be a lizard or something, but you know, or an orangutan, but, you know, from their point of view, that's not true. Okay, so going back to the Amazon, this is what it's being made into. Recent estimates are that up to 91% of it is for <coughs> growing crops like soy and corn, much of it to feed our cattle. In feedlots like this, which you've, if you've ever driven up I-5 in California, I'm sure you've seen and smelled these kind of feedlots, which is where cattle get finished. First six months may often be on the open range, but the last six months it's like that. It's like 91% for cattle. Ah, but the good news, <laughs> okay, is every day you eat vegan, animal product free, you save 30 square feet of forest. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, it adds up. In 25 years, that would be like we bought 27 suburban lots. You know, I didn't know we had that much land. <laughs> so I say, there is hope. <laughs> Now, overfishing by itself is a major problem because trawlers like this, we're strip mining the oceans. By 2040, experts in Cowspiracy are saying we may not have any more fishing left to do in the ocean, period. Fukushima or not. And that's because of how much we're taken out. For every pound of target fish, four pounds of other fish are killed in nets, <coughs> including dolphins and sharks. And then half of that catch goes to what? To feed our livestock in our fish farms. And it's fed to cows, which aren't supposed to be eating meat, but it helps them grow faster. And of course it's polluted, you know, with all kinds of toxins. So a number of experts, and this is one of the major ones, and he's written some great books, Comfortably Unaware and other things. He says there's, there is really no such thing as sustainable fishing. This should not be put on the label of places like Whole Foods. None of it is sustainable. They just go from one species to the next wiping each one out. All of the world's 17 major fisheries are depleted now or in serious decline <clears throat> because we think we need to eat fish that's healthy and we're using it for products like fish oil, kind of supplements, and we're feeding a lot of it to animals and especially to farm-raised fish. But each day that you eat plant-based, you save, on average, one animal's life. Well, I don't, you know, people don't eat a cow a day. So it must, a lot of that must be things like shrimp, right, and little animals like that, if you add them all up. I'm not quite sure how that was calculated. But that's not over 9,000 in 25 years. By 2040, you'd say. Okay, land use. This is a big one. Land use and food production. Well, this is a UN report that land... Uh, is getting degraded, there's water shortages, threatening global food production. This is a degraded dry land ecosystems and so on, really affecting a lot of people. Not so much here yet, but we're getting there. And then meanwhile, a billion of us are overfed, and that's mostly due to too much meat, eggs, and dairy, which consumes a lot of grain. And then a, another billion or so humans are suffering or dying from hunger. 
It's interesting, this is counterbalance. These are a couple of twins in Burma on the right there. A child dies from malnutrition every 2.3 seconds. By the end of the talk, I guess it'd be almost 200, 380. We don't know them, but it could have been yours or mine. And 20 million humans die from hunger every year. I haven't done the math on that, like how many will happen during this talk, but that's a lot. Now here's an interesting thing. If we ate only 10% less meat, the cropland was being used to feed those animals, could feed 100 million people. They can't afford to buy the grains because we're, we're using them for these other purposes. We have the money. We can't. We do it because we can. So look at this. U.S. corn and oats. We feed livestock 80% of U.S. corn and 95% of U.S. oats. But now here's the mighty potato. Potatoes, you can grow 40,000 pounds per acre or you could grow 250 pounds of beef. Think about that for food security. And it's not that hard to grow potatoes most places. You could do it in your backyard. Potatoes supply enough protein for human beings. You may not believe that. We'll go into that a bit. As well as vitamin C, potassium, and a lot more. We could survive on them if we had to, according to experts. And there's, I mean, it's not an ideal diet. You want to have more nutrients in your diet, in any diet. But the UN says here, in 2008, it was declared the International Year of the Potato, noting it's a staple food in the diet of the world's population, and we need to focus the world attention on the role it can play in providing food security and eradicating poverty. It started out in, in uh, South America. It was the main staple of the Incans. Uh, so John McDougall, an MD from Santa Rosa, California, who has been advocating plant-based diets since the early 1980s, about the time we wrote our book. It's sort of a parallel life. Rodell Press, even. And he was going great guns. And about 1970, George McGovern and others were on some commissions saying the Senate, the U.S. guidelines for diet should be very much plant-heavy, meat low. And they thought they'd solved it all. They'd figured out that's the healthiest thing. And then what happened? The livestock industry came along, very powerful, and said, nope, no, no, no. You can talk in terms of cholesterol or protein or fat or whatever, but you can't talk in terms of meat or animal products. That's not good. And, and even now, and especially now, there are gag laws that prevent you from saying anything negative about perishable food, which means them, really. And you could go to prison for doing that. It's unconstitutional, but it, it's there. They're powerful. So John McDougall says we need to go back to starches. I mean, starches have gotten such a bad rep. And if you take away nothing else from this presentation, please open your mind to this question, this anti-grain, anti-starch propaganda that's been going on for the last 20 years. As he points out, rice, corn, wheat, rye, barley, potatoes, squash, these were the foundations of every large, major, successful population in human history. We're not talking about Eskimos. They're not a large population. They're living on, they're living on the extremes. We're talking about and Native Americans. Native Americans had near vegan diets in many places. And yes, in the northern areas and all that, yeah, and I think the Ice Ages drew a lot of us into hunting. And then some of what I read is that they think that maybe some of the first humans to kill animals did it to defend the tribe from predators. Then when they discovered they could do it, then they said, oh, here's another source of food. And that led to hunting. And then they spread you know, around the world to more extreme climates where they couldn't grow stuff year round or peck it off the forest floor. And then the Ice Ages came. So, you know, that was a survival thing for a long time. And maybe, you know, psychologically, we think at some level we have to have it to survive. But really, we're primates. Primates eat almost entirely vegan diets. They are a little bit of opportunistic. They might eat a little rat, a little lizard, a little slug now and then, a little grub. But they primarily eat about half leafy greens and about half fruit. The little bit of shoots and nuts and things like that, you know, tubers and things here and there too, but that is what they eat. And we have grinding jaws that go side to side. Carnivores go up and down. Our canines are insignificant compared to theirs. We have long digestive systems which can process all the starches and grains. Theirs are short, so they can get the toxic meat products out of their body quickly because they, they break down into things like uric acid and things that are hard on the body you have to eliminate. And in fact, herbivore animals generally live longer than carnivorous animals, I think for those reasons, if you think about it. So John McDougall says this is a so-called paleo diet. It's just take every guru who pr promotes that, and they get money off of it. 
is taking us closer to the end of the world as we know it. Okay, let's look at some numbers here. This is from the movie tonight, Cowspiracy. A vegan diet takes about a sixth of an acre. Hey, you could do that. <laughs> a vegetarian diet takes three times as much, a half an acre. But there they are, you know, it's kind of doable if you had little land. An omnivorous diet, the standard American level of eating meat, takes three acres. So it takes, on average, about 18, just all the different resources are about 18 to 20 times more for a omnivorous diet than for a plant-based diet. So healthy vegan foods could feed right now without adding any more to our agricultural land. We could feed like twice the world's population right now, which it's going to get to, they're saying. I don't know if it's going to because of all the health issues, but they're saying we're, the world's population is going to double by mid-century. What are we going to do? Okay, so, so the good news, okay. Every single day you eat plant-based, you save the equivalent. These aren't quite full sacks because you use them. They're 25-pound sacks. Almost 50 pounds, like 40, 45 pounds of grain. I mean, imagine cooking all that up. You could feed a lot of people every day. Okay. All right, on this question, I knew it was going to come up. Okay, how about grass-fed beef or sheep or whatever? Now... These folks talk in the movie tonight, and they're, they're wonderful people. They, they're out in California, nice lush green grasslands there, and that's a natural grassland. You know, you don't really want to convert it to crop if you can help it. You keep to let the flowers and the, all the insects and birds and everything live there. And they do have a better life. You know, all these years of eating vegetarian, I now think I wish I'd eaten grass-fed beef instead of milk, eggs, and dairy because they have a better life. They all get killed in the end in the same way. So it does use the grasslands. You know, it's not ideal for crops. And it leaves room for nature. Okay, it's organic. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. Okay, but if all the meat that we're eating in the U.S. was grass-fed, here's the size of the U.S., red. The gray is how much land it would take. This guy calculated it out in the movie tonight. This is how much we actually have that you could call rangeland. So you can see, we'd have to cut down the amount of meat we eat to whatever this proportion is. I never did calculate that out. That looks like about maybe 20% or less. If you insist on eating meat, I'd say go for grass-fed, but pay the price. They say that if we weren't subsidizing agriculture right now, the cost of like a steak would be like you know, $20 or $30 for a pound of it. A hamburger would be like maybe $12 to $20. But our taxpayer money is going in to huge subsidies by these huge industries. It's bigger than I thought. <laughs> it's like, my grandfather used to get paid to not grow wheat in Illinois. He was just a small farmer, it had been. And that was a kind of a byproduct of the Depression, but it morphed into this whole kind of subsidy for people that, basically so they can afford to feed cows and chickens and pigs. The cows like it, you know? Because if you can't... <laughs> Oh, the U.S. Was a, was a big pasture. He took down all the forests, all the cities and everything to make it grassland, and then you went down into South America and everything. I think they think that was pretty cool. <laughs> so we wouldn't be here to kill them. <laughs> so in any case, a third of Earth's land is desertifying due to overgrazing. That's happening on our grasslands. And they're killing millions of predators every year to make it happen. Rancher just calls up the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they come out and they kill the coyotes, and they kill the bobcats, they kill the bears. They kill whatever needs killing to keep the livestock alive. And they overgraze the land. Okay, next topic, <laughs> fossil fuel decline. I mean, this one alone could be, it's pretty scary, and could be by itself as an issue. So this is from the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. They say with the current levels and so forth. By 2040, production levels may be down to about 20% of what we currently consume. And at the same time, population may be twice as large and more of it industrialized. What are we going to do? What the hell are we going to do? <laughs> but if you, if you care about your kids or your grandkids or anybody you know, I mean, it's something that we've got to consider. So, <laughs> here's a depleted oil field, and there's a lot of them. Not a pretty sight. Now, there's been a lot of movies made. This is one of them about, you know, what kind of chaos might happen in such a world. And that they're scary. You can go watch them if you want. So, 
temperature? Well, it takes 10 to 35 times as much fossil fuel to produce animal versus plant protein, especially from grain-fed beef. And you know, some of this is transport. A lot of it's like growing the crops, heating the factory farms, cooling them, washing, burning all the equipment and stuff, the slaughterhouse equipment. But here's an interesting thing. An average American spends the same amount on fossil fuels eating meat as you would if you drove some over 16,000 miles. I don't know what the mileage is they were calculating that from. But I thought that was kind of good news. Woohoo! You know, the two of us, we could drive across the, in our Prius with, you know, twice the mileage. We could drive, drive across the U.S. 20 times now and feel guilt-free. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think we can find vegan food in Kansas? Gosh, I don't know. Well, they're salad bars. <laughs> Buffets. I mean, it's not the best, but yeah. Okay. Greenhouse gas. Now, this is a controversial subject, and I will say, even though I'm a liberal, quote, I weigh in on the side of I really don't know, because I have read some books indicating that the earth is resilient, that there's other things like, like water vapor is a much bigger greenhouse gas. And... There are long-term astronomical things happening with the tilt of the Earth, the precession of the poles, and the ellipsis of the orbit around the Earth, indicating we may have another period of glaciation coming on that's due. These two things might be duking it out. It might have something to do with the extremes we're having. In any case, most of Earth's history, we've had much more CO2, much higher temperatures, and it's been okay. It's just different. It's more tropical. It's different. But, so, not, you know, we don't know. No one knows for sure how this is going to go. But so many people are warning about it. Why don't we do everything we can? Plus, you know, reducing CO2 emissions solves other problems like fossil fuel use. My educated view is that the biggest problem really is resource depletion. The carbon dioxide has gone up and down, and the Earth's climate has changed so much that the man-made issues involved in this are really relatively insignificant. But if fear of greenhouse gases keeps you up at night... Well, it turns out that methane from livestock, as well as their CO2, but especially their methane, their farts, basically, are, were estimated by the UN to contribute more than all transportation sectors combined. Let that sink in for a minute. So, so all the jet flying, all the driving, all the trucking of stuff around, the trying to be a locavore and all that stuff, just, just having cows around you know, is, is doing this. It's, it's creating a lot of methane, especially. This is the report here. It was in 2006. It's called Livestock's Long Shadow. Okay, so now a little perspective. What is a pound of CO2? Oh, it's about an exercise ball. I looked this up. You know, two and a half feet cross. Okay. So every day that you eat a plant-based diet, vegan, you would save about 20 of these balls worth of carbon dioxide from going up into the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's 20 balls worth, okay? <laughs> That's Richard on the right there tossing it. <laughs> okay. This is actually a... a um, the daughter of, of an employee we used to have, she was vegan and raised her daughter vegan, and never talked to us about it. I wish she had. Okay, that's why I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay, she, anyway, so she's telling us, you know, a little girl, she's very sweet, that, you know, every day you save, in summary, 1,100 gallons of fresh water, 30 square feet of forest, enough fuel to drive 46 miles, 45 pounds of grain, 20 pounds of CO2, and one animal's life, not last but least. Thank you. <laughs> and you give everyone a brighter future. So our diets matter. To me, it's not just a personal choice, honestly. Brenda Davis, registered dietitian, is a, an authority on vegan diets. And she says it's arguably one of the most powerful steps a person can take towards preserving the, the planet. It takes 20th of the resources. And she has an interesting video on YouTube. We watched Myths and Realities of the Paleo Diet. And she said, actually, when you analyze it, that the so-called paleo diet of today isn't as close nutritionally as the vegan diet is to what anthropologists now think that early peoples actually ate. They ate a lot of plants and raw foods and so forth that were very dense in nutrients. Paleo diet, Myths and Realities, very interesting. Now, she estimates... 
I think it was somewhere around three planets if we ate the standard American diet, everybody. That's the SAD, SAD, standard American diet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> SAD. You know, so three to four planets, it's not going to happen. Although the world, everybody in the third world, they're catching up with us, trying to eat a lot of meat. There's more meat consumed now in China than in the U.S. Not per capita, but total. They're mostly eating pork, getting fat. Okay, what if we all eat paleo? Come on, people, paleo diet. <laughs> Ten planets, we don't have them. We've got to do something different. So we might ask ourselves, you know, again, is eating animal products really a matter of personal choice? I mean, it is in the sense nobody's making you do anything, but... Okay, let's say that you say, I, I feel like I really need some, or I want some, or where I am, it kind of works because we go hunting and there's a lot of, you know, extra deer or whatever. Or we raise it in the backyard and, you know, it works somehow in our system. Okay, if we choose to, though, on average, how much might be sustainable? We all probably know Michael Pollan, who wrote a lot of books on, on diet. He's, he estimates about two ounces a week. What is that? That's actually about half a burger, half a quarter pounder a week. This is what we are eating in terms of weight. We're eating nine ounces a day, which is 63 ounces a week. You know, so that's pretty much I tried to make it visual so you can get a good sense of that. And then here's a guy, this is a wonderful man, Howard Lyman. He was raised on a ranch in Montana, multi-generational thing, and he went to college in agricultural science, and he decided he wanted to become a businessman. So he ended up with 10,000 head of cattle at one point. He did this for like 30 or 40 years. Then he got seriously ill with a cancer on his spine and, and miraculously recovered from it, and it changed his life, and he decided... Somehow in all that, he decided to just give up all that. He became a vegan. Not only that, he's a vegan activist. He was on Oprah Winfrey, and he, he had to endure five years of lawsuits from the cattle industry because he said some things about mad cow disease and stuff. They didn't like it. So he won, but he said now he would lose. Nine years? Okay. Okay, so he says, like, what's a sustainable amount? None. He says, you can't call yourself an environmentalist and eat animal products, and yet 80% of, or more of Americans do think that they're environmentalists. And, well, we don't know this stuff. See, I'm just trying... We're learning it. Oh, my gosh, you know. Well, okay, the good news. <laughs> if we do choose to eat a healthy plant-based diet or any kind of, even a junk one, but let's do a healthy one. In just five years of doing that, you alone, just each one of us, <clears throat> will save. <clears throat> hey, there's Swirl Lake. <laughs> Two million gallons of fresh water. That's a lot, right? 42 tons of grain. That's just you. Did you know you ate that much? <laughs> And that could be a lot of people. And then 55,000 square feet of forest, 5 to 10 house lots. Over 18 tons of CO2 emissions. Don't have figures on methane. And 1,825 animals' lives, 99% of which of the land animals are factory farmed. And it feels good. <laughs> We have run into a lot of really fun pictures of interspecies relationships. And look how that sweet pig can smile. You know, there's a really a good video we saw, too, called 101 Reasons to Eat Vegan. It's by, the, by a Florida animal rights group. And they compared little pigs and puppies a lot. Like, why do you eat one and, and love the other one? He shows how similar they are in, some, in a lot of ways. <laughs> okay, so after night after dinner, on all this environmental stuff, don't miss this movie. I reviewed it online as the movie of the decade. That's, and I've bought 55 copies of it and given away most of them. That's how strongly I feel about it. I noticed it's also mentioned by a lot of other people. Okay, now the health imperative. This family right here is the family of John McDougall, who were all, have all been eating vegan since they were born or since, you know, since 1980 or so. All looking fit, healthy, and trim. And... Um, he doesn't believe in drugs, you know, he doesn't use drugs in his practice. He's not a homeopath, he's not like that. But he just thinks he can heal everything with diet. Okay, well, human health is indeed declining. We can't deny this. We're seeing global epidemics of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you know, cancer, I mean, lots of things. I mean, arthritis, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, all these different things. And the WHO in 2000 said 
that shift towards refined foods, which is a problem, I think, with grains, and foods of animal origin, meat and dairy products, and increased fats was behind the global epidemics. So vegetarian diets, according to the World Cancer Research Fund, based on 4,500 cancer research studies, that's pretty significant, decrease the risk of cancer. They recommend that you choose predominantly plant-based diets that are rich in a variety of vegetables, fruits, and legumes if you want to avoid cancer, which I do. Toxins in our food. Okay, now this is a part, you now Richard's kind of, you know, addressed this a lot in an article he wrote recently for um, Dogs Naturally. Like, well, there's a lot of, you know, people into the barf diet and all that, that bones and raw food that, that are really anti-grain for animals. And so he, it was a touchy subject. They almost wouldn't let him publish it, in spite of who he is. So these are things that he contributed here. Okay, over 80,000 chemicals have been released into our environment since the chemical industry came along for all kinds of use, industry, commerce, home, little or no consideration about where they go. Much of our ecosystem globally, air, water, soil, is laden with these chemicals. They've even found uh, flame retardants at the North Pole. Okay, most eventually drain into the oceans, which are dying off partly for this reason. This is an old DDT truck. They used to not think anything of it. When we were kids, we were kids, most of us, not you young folks, but... <laughs> This is what we got. Yeah, and they sprayed it all over for mosquitoes and everything. I used to do that in Los Angeles. Yeah. I ran behind the trucks in the fog. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, now look at us. You know, it's like, it's like I, I have restless leg syndrome. I wonder if some of it's related to this, you know. But 90% have never been tested for health effects of these 80,000 chemicals. Okay. But even so, you know, when they do sometimes assay tissues, they find 100 to 200 such chemicals in the average American's body, and 98% of us still have DDT, even though it's been banned since the early 1970s when we got all environmental. And Nixon even was. I mean, that was pretty neat. It's not like that now. Okay, so how do they affect us? That, well, that's a good question. We, we do know they concentrate up the food chain. Meat has been found to have 14 times the pesticide levels as commercially, not organically, commercially grown plant foods. That's significant, isn't it? I mean, when people worry about, you know, Getting, buying organic or not produce. I mean, just don't eat meat, and you'd be saving off a lot of pesticides. In fact, we wrote the first edition of our book. We saw some study somewhere so long ago, it's you know, lost in the papers, but we're breath, vegetarian, not even vegan. Women had 5% of the level of, of pesticides in their breast milk, as did omnivorous women. Dairy has 4.5 times as much pesticides in it as plant foods, commercially grown. Fish especially concentrate toxins up to th thousands, up to millions of times the levels that are in the water. And then, you know, with Fukushima, it's pretty scary. I mean, I don't know about you, but after that happened, we went and bought up all the kelp we could find before it spread, I mean, like within a few days. That could be a wild card that, you know, blows it all, but we do, the, do our best. Okay, infants. Infants of meat-eating mammals, <laughs> us, puppies, kittens, and so forth, are at the very top of the food chain. Think about it. She's eating meat of animals that are being fed meat, either fish or dairy cows, and he's eating her. <laughs> so, so he's like three levels up in the food chain. And if she's eating a lot of fish, most fish are carnivorous, so they have, they're concentrating it as they move up. That's why tuna and stuff like that has such high levels of mercury. I'm sorry it's this way. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I did it. So 30% of breastfeeding women have been found to have Roundup in their milk. Actually, I think it'd be higher than that. But Okay, the highest levels of chemicals are found in children, which shows us that accumulation is increasing with each generation and, and isn't, aren't health problems too? I mean, I know so many people that are having cancer, strokes, and whatnot in their 40s and 50s. I, I almost never heard of that in my parents' generation. Some of you are too, probably too young to even have much of a memory about that. I'm really old, like 65. But <laughs> Richard's like ancient, 73. So. so what's the research on this? <laughs> I told him his, I told his secret. He's still all right for 73, you know? Okay, so. He looks good, yeah. He's lost some weight. We, I know it. We've both lost weight since eating on this diet, too. Yeah, okay? So, <laughs> so it hasn't been well studied. Most of the studies have not been on dogs or cats or people. 
but on mice, rats, and rabbits. Now, we do know that some of the heavy metals are directly toxic. I mean, we know that, you know. I, well, I was tested for heavy metals a year and a half ago. So was D and some other people I know. They're, they were really high in us. I mean, over the supposed scale. I'm, and I wasn't clear why. And there's ways you can chelate it out. It's, it's kind of a process. But I've, I've heard people say that on, if you do it through diet, a diet that's very low in things, your body will naturally excrete things like this and in a safer way, instead of like a water fast, you know, or a juice fast or something that's kind of radical where it can release it into your other tissues. It's also been found that the two or more of these chemicals are like synergistic with each other, an enhanced effect. I kind of begin to imagine like how does all this play together? All we know is we need to try to avoid taking it in as much as we can. And they found that the, the gut biome is affected, resulting in leaky gut. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And that rises in glyphosate, the weed killer in you know, Roundup. It's like what they spray on GMO crops, on soy, corn, canola, cotton. And now we learned recently, maybe you, many of you knew this before, I didn't know this, that for since the 1980s or 90s or something, they've been spraying this Roundup stuff on wheat just to help it all come to harvest at the same time. Ever notice in the natural food store, you go there, you get a loaf of whole wheat bread, it almost never says organic on it. I'm, I'm guessing, I haven't totally researched this, but I'm guessing that it's just a lot easier and more economical to bring it all to harvest at the same time and desiccate it and all that. And so they do it. And so, you know, like organic wheat, it just probably costs them too much. All the wheat products we eat that are commercial. So what does Roundup do? It kills plants. They said the LD50 on, on Roundup, um, on, that, on the chemical that's in it, and clean up and all those things, was like 50, I think, parts per million or something like that in dogs. That's a high level. It's like you have to take a huge amount to kill you. It's not a problem. But it kills plants. <coughs> the gut biome is mostly plants. So it kills the good gut bacteria. And then, you know, some of the vegan physicians, I saw this one talk, said, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but he's just saying basically it imbalances your gut biome and causes leaky gut, and therefore a lot of other things. Celiac disease is really correlated. Here's 1990 when they first started spraying glyphosate on the U.S. wheat crop since 1990. Celiac disease has gone up very, very closely with that. You know, gluten sensitivity too, which is not as extreme. And celiac disease is, can be truly threatening. Well, I remember wheat has like 70% more gluten than it did for two Yes, there's that too. Yeah, yeah they, they hybridized wheat to make it have more protein, which is gluten is protein. So that would, you know, feed the third world or whatever, because everybody thought we needed protein. So now, but a lot of people find, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this, that if you go to Europe and eat the more traditional pastas, people who are, you know, gluten intolerant do okay. And we found that, I found that the spelt and, and some of those other things, I, I seem to do better. I kind of got gassy and stuff from, from all that, and I seem to be doing better. I followed the protocol that I'll show you in a minute. I think it helped. Okay, Richard hasn't had issues. He loves wheat. <laughs> so, I think it's more women. I don't know. Anyway, so... Now, a lot of these chemicals, because they're synthetic, we're not made to process them. Our bodies don't maybe know how. And so if they can't eliminate them for the normal you know, organs of elimination, they will accumulate in tissues, and they accumulate especially in the fat. I mean, I guess the liver too, right? I mean, in other places, but especially the fat. A lot of us are a little bit overweight. Some are really overweight. So some of these are hormones, which may interfere with the endocrine system, lead to obesity, other conditions. Hormones used in livestock, it has been found can still be active in the food. Okay, we have a problem, Houston. Okay. <laughs> that speaks for itself. Okay. <laughs> Americans killed annually due to excess weight, 280,000. It must be more than that, actually. Yeah. And uh, risk of diabetes in very obese people is 40 times greater. Woohoo. Whoa. That'll get you. Okay, <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff online, you know? Okay, some of the negative effects. I know. <laughs> Most of us here are doing pretty well. This is a pretty health conscious group, but you know, we all know a lot of people that are pretty obese, okay? So lower life expectancy, uh, cancer, joint problems, yeah. Heart attacks, low self-esteem, depression, breathing problems, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, increased sweating, high cholesterol, limited mobility, Arthritis, you know, carrying all that weight. Social discrimination, deep vein thrombosis, bone problems, fewer employment opportunities, and lower life expectancy. 
Now look at this, how the, the U.S. obesity rate has gone up. If you, I should have gotten the meat consumption too because it's gone up also. We eat a lot more meat than we did in 1920, a lot more. Um, our grandparents or whatever. So, um, okay, overweight including obese. Okay, let's look at this top line. Here it was, you know, like 45%. Yeah, it's different figures. It depends on how they count it, I guess. Anyway, age 20 to 74. Maybe they drop off after 74. Anyway, it's, it's a lot. It's going up. <laughs> Overweight but not obese. It's kind of been more level. But uh, what's really gone up has been obese. This is from 1960 to 2003. Okay, here's where, actually here's where a lot of the changes happened with chemicals getting more into our lives, about 1990 and stuff. I mean, that's interesting. And also, that's, what, that's when the paleo diet started to get, Atkins and things like that started getting popular. This here, this kid, I honestly, okay, see, see these fat folds here? There were some like that on this kid, and I airbrushed them out. I thought, God, maybe that's like they exaggerated that or something. You know, I better make it look like, more like real skin. And so I, I kind of airbrushed that out. But then I, saw, then I found this kid. I realized, this is real. This is how they look. So seven, right now, three out of four people in India are overweight. But is, is it because you're eating the wrong foods, too? Have you been to India? No, I haven't. <laughs> well, I know. I, I can say this is all an Indian website. I yeah. Indians right. The ones on the street might be begging. You know, I don't know. You know, but here, you, you know, you can see some nice fat folds and stuff. About half of urban Indians are obese. It said on the Indian website. Yeah. Are you talking about Native Americans? No, no, Hindu. India. India. Yeah, okay. Uh, the average person goes from healthy at 26 to obese at 38. Yeah, I, I just present it to you. And this is the thing I found online. It said, the U.S. used to have the highest rates of obesity for large countries until obesity rates in Mexico surpassed that in the U.S. in 2013. Well, a lot of people in the third world or whatever are, are developing world are using or eating junk foods, sodas, meat. I mean, they're getting the standard American diet now. And that's really changed. And you... And, you know, you've, you've seen some overweight animals. Maybe not this bad. I don't know. You have? Some? A lot? Okay. How many? What? Nothing like that. Yeah, okay. This is the extreme case. Okay. I googled overweight animals. That's what came up. I was in a hurry. But, all right. So, now, this is interesting. This has a little bit lower number of, of overweight or obese Americans. Okay. Depends, I don't know what year this was. But, anyway, by comparison, children were less. Vegetarian children were much less. See? And I, vegans were less than vegetarians. Vegans were like one or two percent were overweight or obese. The, That's a good book. Yeah, the, yeah. The China study was a bestseller on Amazon, and it's based on the work of T. Colin Campbell, who's been called the Einstein of nutrition. He's at yeah. Cornell, and actually Sarah, I won't do that on you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Studied, took a course with him, and um, so he. The China study was a huge, I forget how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were originally in the survey, but they looked at diet after their, one of their premiers or whatever died of cancer. He wanted to know how cancer correlated with diet. So they found a really high correlation with animal foods. And it wasn't 100%. Like some, there were some places that were exceptional, and some people argue with it because of that. But anyway, there's thousands of studies, and I've heard some of the plant-based physicians say they've gone over 50,000 studies, they and their team. And they say these studies show things like improved blood glucose, weight loss, reduced cholesterol, and lower risk of many diseases, diabetes, heart disease, cancers, arthritis, MS, dementia, and many other chronic diseases. Then there's also been maybe a dozen or so really prominent plant-based physicians who've been at this for several decades different ages, some are older, some are younger. And one of them is Neil Barnard here. If you can just get one book, I'd either get this one or this one. Um, start Solution or Forks Over Knives. Or, but if you have had heart issues, which I know some of you have, this would be a good one. Okay, so um, now there's a lot of also just sort of dietitians. they tend to be more women, uh, uh, who show you how to cook and how to make either gourmet meals like this lady here. This is kind of the nutritionist book. And this one here is like someone whose kids became vegan and she researched it. She's, she took Colin Campbell's course and she found a really simple, real common sense program. And then Forks Over Knives that you may have heard of. Yeah? Susan, what was the cookbook that you used to give the, cook the recipes of the ranch here? 
That was online. That was McDougal Seminars. I, they had a PDF online of their, their meal plan, and then they had recipes for Is free. Is there a way for you to give that to us if we wanted to make some of that stuff? Yeah. Well, on the handout, uh, there's a, a link there to a list of recommended videos and, and books and stuff. It's got links. on my. I've posted a lot of PDFs like that, and I'll put that one up. You know, so, so that's the best way to do it. So if you just, you know, after the talk's over, sometimes you want to research this, there's... We've spent like four months watching videos and stuff, and some of our favorite ones. Oh, that's the best way to get the information. They boil it down, you know, in an hour. And I know you're all busy. So, okay, here's John McDougall, and his wife is an art, as a nurse. Okay, they have a lot of online videos and series. He's really generous with his information. He doesn't really have, I don't think, a regular practice so much as he just has seminars where people eat low-fat vegan diets. And he watches them get better, you know, and he educates them about why they need to do this. He was writing some successful books, and then he stopped doing it when the paleo Atkins high protein stuff came in because the publishers would not. The sales is not going to sell, you know. People want to eat meat, so they're not going to want to do this. So. so he was out of things for a while, but he came back with a vengeance a few years ago because he started worrying about his children, his grandchildren, and the future of the earth. It's the more he learned about the environmental issues, he's a good guy, outspoken. Irishman. <laughs> and then this is Michael Clapper. I'm going to take a seminar with him in May. He also lives in Santa Rosa and has been a vegan doctor for a long time and is also fit and trim. They both go running every day. You know, they're like in their late 60s, early 70s. And his books aren't so available now, it seems like, or they're out of print, so they're kind of expensive. But he, so he's a little hard to get videos and stuff from, too. But he's in the movie tonight, and he has some good things to say, especially on dairy. Now, this guy you may have heard of, he's in Forks Over Knives film, if you've seen that. He's really looked at what this diet can do for heart disease, and he's had some spectacular results, sometimes within a few hours, I think he said, or days, on people, people eating at his seminars, their blood values will improve you know, visibly. And his son, Rip Esselstein, was a fireman, and he, he retired from that to do pep talk seminars. And there's going to be one in Sedona, also next door to the one that I'm taking. And they take a lot of overweight people, people with diabetes have been referred there, and, and they, they do kind of a makeover, like in a week. And they, uh, there's all kinds of great testimonies online about how much better they feel, how much weight they lost, and how their blood values improved in a few days. And they, he really emphasizes no added oils. Now, this is the hard part for a lot of people on this diet. They're saying, they, they're, what they're really saying is whole food, un, totally unprocessed, really, as much as you can, it's other than like you cook your grains or whatever, but beans, but you, you don't refine oils out of their natural things. So you can have nuts and stuff, you know, and you can have avocados, and you can grind them up in the blender and make kind of a sauce, but you don't extract it out. And partly I think it throws the omega-3 th and 6 ratios off too much, and, and it's also empty calories, and, and it, you know, I'm not totally sure of all the reasons that they say this, but they find that it works. <laughs> And you know, some people dispute that. I know some people, like you know, like Dr. McCullough and others, are really advocating high-fat diets now, or coconut or whatever, you know. But anyway, that to me, that's detail. It doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> like the environmental part is really important. So this is Dr. Camp. He, again, he's the one that was called the Einstein of nutrition. He's he's an older guy. He must be in his 80s now. He started out on a dairy farm when he was a kid, and he was out to save the world from <coughs> from protein deficiency. And he did a lot of work in the third world, and then through one step or another. He, he kind of discovered that was, was, was not the problem. The problem was they weren't getting enough calories. And that actually, protein was dangerous too much. He says that casein is one of the most potent carcinogens ever found that he's tested in, in you know, cheese and milk and stuff. So this guy's an interesting one I've discovered recently, Michael Greger. He's a younger one. And he studied with Colin Campbell at Cornell. He's more involved with the Humane Society. And he looks at factory farming and the, the effects of of that on, you know, and antibiotics and so forth on hormones on human health. And he also has a lot, he generously shares a lot of videos online. And he goes into details of subjects like, what about B12, what about EFAs, what about protein, etc., in vegan diets. Neil Bernard, also, you know, these, all these guys were raised on farms. He was raised on a, on a beef ranch in North or South Dakota. He sort of jokes a lot about his family, and none of them have come around, <laughs> I don't think. Anyway, he founded the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicines, written a lot of good books, especially if you happen to have diabetes. I would, um, or at risk for it, I would read this one. Breaking the Food Seduction, if you are addicted to cheese and you wanted to try this out. He, he says basically, 
Then in about three weeks, your body will rework itself to its addictions, and your tastes and stuff will change, and you'll actually come to prefer healthier foods, which is, or, or just whatever you're eating. This is what we have found. We, we tried this before. We couldn't give up cheese. It was just too hard. It was, we were eating a sandwich, cheese sandwiches five times a week. And as vegetarians, we thought we needed the protein or whatever. <laughs> not true, not true, not true. And so when we learned that, and when we learned that the immense suffering that dairy cows and their calves go through, it was over. Our love affair was over. And we just went cold turkey, and we actually, <laughs> cold, cold cheese, we went cold cheese, <laughs> and we actually ended up feeding our nice organic, you know, cayenne cheese to the neighborhood cat. And finally, he wouldn't eat it anymore. It was getting too moldy, so <laughs> we threw it out. We just didn't want it. It didn't taste good. It just seemed like goo. Susan, did you consider goat cheese? Well, I've had goat cheese. Goats go through the same suffering. It's all the same issues. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, you might be less allergic to it because you haven't been exposed to it all your life. But, you know, I'm done with animal products, personally. You, you, people who want to consume them, that's probably the least allergenic right now. You know, and, and, and it's not necessarily the most humane. It could be, but not necessarily. A lot of small, quote, humane farms, they do all the same stuff, you know, with the anesthetized castrations and dehorning and all these things, you know. Most of them, yeah. So, all right, Dr. Fuhrman, he's a little bit of a different animal here. Yeah, he's been, he's pretty well known. He calls it nutritarian eating, and he, he says plant foods highly correlate with, with health, and he's once done 50,000 studies and so on. But he says, you know, if you want to eat a little fish, that's okay. It's pretty close to the, the, the middle of, the, of his scale that he has. Okay, and he, but he does say here that uh, he's, he's seen thousands of people lose dramatic amounts of weight without difficulty, never regain it. More importantly, they recovered from things like allergies, asthma, acne, headaches, high blood pressure, diabetes, reflux, esophagitis, lupus, kidney insufficiency, angina, cardiomyopathy, myopathy, multiple sclerosis, and many more. He says the results have been astounding. And he's long studied and utilized high nutrient eating as a medical therapy, but even he's been surprised by the powerful results. Worth listening to. Okay, the protein myth. I mean, a lot of people say, I need my protein. What? Plants all have protein. Everything has protein. And the average American vegetarian in a USDA survey gets 150% of the RDA of protein. Beans, nuts, seeds, soy, and whole grains are all high in protein. Human milk, human breast milk. I, I've seen different estimates. You know, Six to 10% of, of calories of RS protein. You know, we don't need 60% of our diet to be protein, you know, like in, in a practically all meat diet. An infant doubles its weight in six months, trebles it a year. When it's, this is at the maximum growth phase. So how can an adult who's not building new tissue at the same rate need more? The World Health Organization weighs in at 5%. That's what's recommended. And in fact, according to Dr. Fuhrman, we just saw, if you have over 10% of protein, you're risking your health. It's hard on your kidneys, your liver, and all these organs of elimination. It's hard on your cardiovascular system and so on in our species. Also, if you're worried about protein, so remember for Francis Moore LePay, the diet for a small planet, you've got to balance your beans and your rice and all this stuff, the amino acids, you know, kind of worrying about it not being complete. Plants have all the amino acids in them. You, they, they've debunked that now. They say you just eat you know, a variety of things. You'll get enough of what you need for humans. Now, cats and dogs are a different thing. They needed carnitine and taurine because they've lost the ability as predators to synthesize those things. All right, so here's like a turkey. It's 41%, okay, of protein is calories. But, but look at here. There's more in broccoli. A tofu is a little bit more, actually. You know, and then brown rice has got 8%. That's all you need. You could just eat brown rice, you know, and some vegetables, and you'd be okay. But, but Susan, yeah. you've got calories. You eat a lot more broccoli. For you would, yes, calories. yes, you uh, that's right. But way. but in brown rice, you you could. Yeah. That's different, you know. So that's why that's why grains are so important. If you don't eat grains, you're going to get sick on this diet, probably. I mean, there are people that eat just fruits and vegetables, and they do okay. But there's some detoxing involved. You could, they eat huge amounts. I saw this video of a woman who eats like 12 bananas for breakfast. Oh my God. And she's healthy looking. She lost all her weight and all this stuff. She's great. You, it's the one way you could go. And she eats like for, for lunch is like 10 potatoes. You know, and dinner is like, you know, a huge thing of grapes. You know, she's on mono dieting. 
But she looked healthy, she was trim, she had lost a lot of weight, she was energetic. There's a lot of ways to do it, but personally I like the middle road, <laughs> you know, verified by nutritionists and doctors. So uh, yeah, here's almonds, 13%, walnuts, 14 kidney beans, 27%. So you just get a variety of those things, plus your, your veggies and stuff, and you're going to get plenty of protein. How do you think cows get it for eating grass? They don't, you know, they... They, yeah. How do you think these body, these vegan bodybuilders get it? You know, they get it eating plants. These are vegans, <laughs> but not all vegans are skinny. <laughs> you better have a slide with vegan women then. Uh, there, there were some, but I didn't put them on because they weren't quite so buff. You know, they were just trim looking. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> There, was, there were so many of them. There were like 20 of them. I just kind of, oh. There were 20 of them? Oh, at least on this, on this website where I found this. Yeah, at least. Yeah. So. <laughs> but wait a minute. My blood type. My blood type says I got to eat meat. Okay, a lot of vegans are typo. I am typo. Rich is typo. And they do fine. You know, maybe, you know, I looked this up. And according to Wikipedia, this has been debunked. You can take it for what it's worth, but research has not verified, validated the idea of the blood type diet correlating with you know the things they say. So, but but meanwhile, all these diets are basically the same thing, you know, pretty much. Starting with Atkins, it's all about high meat, high fat, you know. And yes, you go into ketosis, you will lose weight, but you can't stay with it. You start craving, you know, you start craving the starches. And that you, then you deny it, and then you know there's yo-yo effects, and people it's hard on their kidneys. And if you look at these guys that have advocated these things, they're fat. Most of them are overweight <laughs> compared to vegan doctors that are advocating their diets. I mean, John McDougal has he's 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 kind of relentless on this stuff. So he'll have like a you know <laughs> it's almost insulting, but he has a little video. Okay, paleo guru, fat, you know, <laughs> vegan guru. <laughs> Then he kind of goes back and forth and he shows these famous people and you can just see for yourself, you know, or they die young of heart disease or something. Okay, but wait a minute, I tried a veggie diet, I didn't feel good. Well, it could have been like that. For a lot of people it was like that or they were eating soy substitutes that were based on, they had GMOs probably in them, you know, that were like Boca burgers or something like that, you know, because it's an easy go-to food. And... Um, you know there's problems with, with soy, soy and GMOs and stuff. So you've got to be organic on that stuff and, and also minimally processed. Texturized, textured ve vegetable protein I don't think is such a good thing. Maybe you need a margarita. Yeah, right. And then, but I, but I, I know, I, and I've heard from some of you, and, I've heard, and I know that the vegan physicians hear this story sometimes. I really did try it, and I ate healthfully, and it didn't work for me, especially when I was having children. And um, some of the things, we all need to explore this, you know, and just kind of find out... And, talk about it and sort of try to find out, well, I look at what were you actually eating? Uh, possibly you weren't getting enough grains. I've noticed that some of you are not eating a lot of grains on this thing here right now. And because you have anti-grain ideas, you're going to collapse of low energy. Car carbohydrates are needed to fuel your brain. You try to get it from protein, it's hard on your kidneys and liver, and we don't have real high protein you know, foods here. If you're allergic to a particular grain, do quinoa or millet or something that's not so common, you know, try them. Potatoes, I mean, have been much maligned. They really can be a good food. Yams, squash, beans. There have been some B12 deficiencies in vegans. It's easy to take. We used to get B12, interestingly enough, I didn't know this, through natural water sources, all the little bacteria in there, the bacteria who makes the B12. And then that gets in the cow systems and all that gets in the meat. But you know they inject B12 into cows now to make sure they have enough level because they're not eating you know, the natural stuff from the grass and so forth. D3, is, you know, we all need to take D probably, you know, unless we get out in the sun a lot, which a lot of us don't. Iodine can be a little bit deficient. Use iodized salt, or they say about 100 micrograms a day, and I've got that on the postcard I'll be giving you. Most people do well in transitioning to a vegan diet. Some have a detox effect and don't feel a little worse initially, and then they get better. Uh, Dr. Clapper, I, he thinks there, some people who've really tried hard could possibly have Lost the ability to make carnitine or taurine or something. Maybe through eating a lot of meat, or maybe there are different <coughs> genetic types. I mean, I, I have noticed a personal observation that the people who have said this to me, which is a very small sample, tend to be kind of Northern European 
looking, you know, blonde kind of women, especially. Fair skinned. I mean, you know, if you were in the ice ages and you were eating a whole lot of the meat up there in those cold places, I mean, maybe you lost, maybe, maybe your kind did lose the ability to make a certain amount of carnitine or taurine. You might try adding that to your diet if you really want to try this diet and see if that helps if you had trouble. Okay, another thing. It really wasn't a vegan diet, but it had a lot of dairy like we did, which can trigger allergies. 75% of humans are lactose intolerant worldwide. In Africa, 90% or lactose intolerant. But see, in Northern Europe, it's only 10%. So there are population differences there on that issue, depending on what they ate historically. But then we've only been eating milk for 10,000 years. You know. Couldn't there be a difference in how much protein different people need then as well? Possibly. But certainly you need more. We know you need more when you're reproducing and you're nursing and you're all or that you stuff. Huh? Yeah. No. <laughs> right. So have more. So have more protein. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So, you know, so have, have beans. As you can see, there's a lot of, there's a lot of high-protein plant foods. So, we're making good progress here. Thank you for your patience. So, ha let's have a little pee break, and we'll be back in, what, half an hour and 10.30? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, this is McDougall's book, and Dr. McDougall has had great success in reversing chronic health problems in over 5,000 patients using this, with many with a 30 to 40 year follow up. So you can have some confidence in this. He also knows a lot more about nutrition than most MDs do, and he has a lot of good things online about that. And again, he says the caloric basis of the diet needs to come from complex carbo natural carbohydrates, like in traditional diets grains, potatoes, squash, yams, legumes, and so on. So he basically says center each meal around a starch, eating all you like of, of that. Minimize the processed forms. I mean, occasionally have some white rice, don't worry. You know, but you go for the brown rice when you can. And don't get a lot of pasta and stuff like that because it is more high glycemic and, you know, more processed and refined. The more whole, the better. I, I ran into a guy who uh, is following kind of this basic sort of program, actually from Esselstein Moore, but basically you can make it as simple as this. In the morning, steel cut oats with a lot of fruit on it, maybe some plant milk, you know, soy milk or almond milk. Lunch. Brown rice, beans of various sorts or other whole grains, basically rice and, you know, grains and beans and salsa. You can put a little cilantro and stuff on it. This isn't like the nutritarian way of doing it, but this is like kind of the more affordable... This is what the world could be sustained on. And this guy that I talked to that's doing this has lost 45 pounds and he looked great. He's an old guy and he's about 75. And <clears throat> dinner, a big salad. So, you know, that way you kind of get a balance of different things. You can keep it really simple. And you could cook up a bunch in advance. Okay, so this gut dysbiosis thing, I think that this is probably a key to a lot of the, the bad press that grains have been getting. Well, they're just learning how huge the gut biome is. It's like trillions or, or, of cells. Uh, the, these guys help ferment the fibers in the grains and beans and other foods. And by the way, Alberto would like to share with you how to really minimize or, re or eliminate gas in beans. You need to soak them overnight, and then you wash them three times, and you don't get gas. This is traditional Mexican knowledge. <laughs> Soak it overnight, wash it three times. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Some people add kombu and, and, or potatoes to help absorb the, the phytates that are a little bit hard for us to digest. Okay, so, or sprout them. You can sprout them too first. I've done, I've tried that too, yeah. And, and just generally cooking your grains well. Grains do need to be cooked or sprouted. So. And, you, and, and go ahead and eat lots of sauerkraut and all those good fermented foods. You know, that's, that's fine. So before yogurt and probiotic pills, we, you know, where do we get our, our natural flora there? We cut them from, I had no idea, from the water, from natural water and from the soil, from picking up little dirt on your sprouts or your, you know, whatever you picked up off the forest floor to eat. But now everything's so sanitized, you know, with chlorinated water and... We wash all our fruits and veggies, and it's all been, you know, packaged and whatnot. So, and I, I think that also that, you know, the pesticides, especially the Roundup being on all these things, is imbalancing the gut flora and causing leaky gut, and thus allergic responses to, you know, incomplete foreign proteins. And here's, a th here's these are the things that he says are basically destroying our good gut bacteria. Chlorinated tap water, you know, chlorine is antibacterial, right? <laughs> Phosphoric acid in sodas, 
uh, coffee and tea and even mint tea. He says those are all antibacterial. You can kind of heal a, an eye infection by putting a tea bag on it. Um, alcohol. Hey, folks. <laughs> that is a germ killer, right? <laughs> oh, darn. And he didn't even li- he did not even list this first the herbicide residues in the food okay and we know that corn soy canola and now we have to add wheat to that list are the ones we really probably need to worry about the most alcohol anti- antibiotics of course I mean probably a number of you or people you know have had you know yeast problems after taking antibiotics and then on top of all this we feed it sugar so here we have a candida overgrowth. So he's saying that, that this weakens the villi in the small intestine where nutrients are absorbed. It creates gaps that allow foreign proteins, antigens, bacteria, and toxins into the blood. And this, in turn, leads to autoimmune conditions of every stripe. Allergies, food sensitivities, hay fever, hives, inflammatory arthritis, chronic fatigue, and so on. Uh, all right, you can test for leaky gut with the intestinal permeability test. Or you can just presume it if there's a lot of autoimmune conditions and try the, the prescription. Since the intestines create a new lining every three weeks, the, the good news, he says, is it can, the whole thing can heal in six weeks. He says, don't argue for your limitations. I mean, just, just heal it. This is what he recommends. Stop all the assaults on the good bacteria for six weeks, okay? That means no alcohol for six weeks. Eat only organic food so you don't have the, the pesticides and stuff. Use only non-chlorinated filtered or spring water. No sugar, soda, coffee, tea, alcohol. If you really want to go for it, if you really think you have a problem with grain sensitivities, if not, don't worry about it. Don't do it. No dairy or wheat, which just because they're major allergenic foods. No pizza. Yeah, right, no pizza. <laughs> exactly. So then he says, in addition, take 1,000 milligrams twice a day of quercetin and glutamine, and that they help kind of heal the gut, basically. And 5 to 10 billion units of a diverse live probiotic. I've been using actually the one from Dr. McCullough. But he says you should test the probiotic by stirring three to four capsules in some milk or soy milk and let it sit overnight. Does it curdle? That one did. And is that good? It was, yeah, that's good. That means it's, it could make yogurt. That means it's got live probiotics in it because they can get killed. They can die. They're not, you know. I know that is a particularly good formula, the Dr. Mercola one. It's, it's not cheap. You don't have to refrigerate it, he says. So when you do this test, is your... No, yeah, I just put the milk out. I sw- and I used soy milk or something like that. And I just put it overnight in a little cup, and it got a little thickened overnight. So if you can't get that or you don't want to get that, just a wide range. Lactobacillus uh-huh. bifidobacteria. Yeah. Several families incorporate sacularity, if you, especially if you've been on antibiotics. Sacularity is the friendly yeast. That often helps repair gut. Okay. Yeah. I have heard that, that sauerkraut has a lot more probiotics in it than, than those pills do. So I would take some sauerkraut, too. Okay, okay prepare thyself. We're going into the humane part. Okay, isn't that a sweet picture? So cows are really good mothers. They're just really gentle, beautiful animals. I'm going to make a painting of that picture. I love it. Isn't it? But this, this is a film we watched. This is called Mad Cowboy, the documentary. It's free online. It's by Howard Lyman, who was on Oprah Winfrey, we showed before. This is a farm couple. And they're saying, no matter how bad your worst day is, it's nothing as compared to what the average farm animal goes through every day for weeks, months, or years. So 97% of us say we're against cruelty to animals, and yet 99% of our 11 billion farm animals, 9 billion of these are birds, are raised in inhumane conditions, which are too confined to stretch their wings or to even turn around. This is the one that got me. This, oh wait, that's not even the one. It's, I have another picture of a pig that's even worse. She's being compressed so she can't even stand up. She just has to lie on her side and be a milking machine to, the, to her piglets all day long. And then here we have, Richard worked in a place like this when he was at Davis. And the chickens were just berserk. You know, it's, it's, it's often dark in these places. And then you got veal calves here. Now, the, the calf thing is what got us to stop drinking dairy products, thinking we were being good vegetarians. Uh, they have to keep the cow pregnant every year, of course, and so to get milk. And so there's the rape rack. That's not much fun. Apparently, a lot of cows try to avoid it. Uh, but then for the artificial insemination. And then when the calf is born, three-fourths of them are slaughtered. All the males, pretty much, within a few months. They're either bob veal. Just one quarter of them, the females, are used to put in the dairy industry. The other half of the females are killed. 
And they're put in these little, if they fatten them up, they're put in these little dolls all by themselves. They're taken away from their mothers within two days. Now somebody we saw on a video, he's never heard such screaming and carrying on and bellowing and, and pain reactions. In any slaughterhouse, this is what he's heard from mother cows and calves calling for each other after they've been separated. <coughs> And that goes on for days, days, weeks. Even in the organic operations, even the, all that. Sometimes they put them within sight of each other. Yeah. That's the where the mother can see it, but can't access it. And then here we have a nice little organic operation, the castrations, the beaking, the dehorning, the, you know, they come, sometimes they cut off extra teats from the, the cows, the tails, all this without anesthesia. I didn't show you pictures, too gross, but they have pictures online where you can see male chicks of layers just being sent down an assembly line and thrown into a, an auger that grinds them up alive. And a lot of them don't quite die, or they plow them under. We won't have too much of this. And here's a, a woman who managed to actually get inside one of these places, and she reports. She says the broiler farm where she went to, which is, you know, this is free range. This is cage-free. 10, 10 to 25,000 chickens in a big dark barn. The air was so thick with feather and fecal dust I had trouble breathing. The floor was spongy with 18 months accumulation of feces. The chickens were crowded, but would get much more crowded after, t after they got bigger. Crowding maximizes profits and so on. But by keeping the birds immobile, it also, they gain more weight. And some of them get so fat because they've been bred that way, they can't even walk and their legs collapse and so on. There's dead ones, they just suspect a certain amount will be dead. These are the chicks that are all raised in little drawers, you know, hatched there. No mommy. Okay, many live always in the dark in stench and stanchion feces, for, and they have to walk over dead, dead or sick ones. These are actually bones and feathers and stuff and feces from dead animals. This is, oh, this is the one that's, you know, that's just pressed down. I mean, I have had restless legs syndrome in my life. If, if, that's like my nightmare. That is it. You know, I can't move. Okay, so here we're taken out the teeth of this little piglet. A lot of piglets that, that are runts are just thrown, slammed against the floor and they cause head trauma. It's the way to kill them. And then the pigs go crazy. They're very intelligent animals, as you probably know. And they, the sows have no bedding, no straw, nothing to do but lie there for 12 years. 12 years, okay. Fe you know, this place reeks of feces. There's huge, huge uh, waste problems in these big ponds. A small farm country in Illinois that I'm from our old family farms have been taken over by places like this, and it's causing pollution. And like North Carolina has particularly got a bad situation there. And then they take them to slaughter, and on the way to slaughter, no matter what the species, you know, most of them have, they don't give them food or water, they don't, you know, it's too hot, it's too cold. They, sometimes they arrive frozen to the edge of the truck. A, a certain number die, they expect it, and they count for it. Here's 10,000 packed into cages. Often they just kind of throw them in the cage, and they might break their legs or wings. This is what we're eating. This is what we're not eating <laughs> this, this weekend. Okay, at the slaughterhouse, chickens, they don't have any law to protect them, but with, with the bigger animals like cows, and ch they're supposed to stun them. Does it, they're going so fast, like one every four seconds or something, they may miss. And they have to cut their throat while they're alive so it'll pump out the blood so people don't have the blood in the meat. They're very careful about who they hire. They don't hire animal rights activists. And sometimes they they, they, they'll stab pigs' snouts and stab them in the eyes before they've even killed them just because they're getting so frustrated and take it out on them. This cow was actually struggling. Okay, so then pigs, and that's just, I think this is true for chickens too, they take them to the scalding tank after they supposedly killed them, but sometimes they're still alive and they're thrashing around for two minutes in hot boiling water. It's been observed by, by workers. Okay, we're almost done. Okay, you can watch now if you've been not watching, I understand. How can we do this? The only way to do it is to hide it. We, I drive down the highway in Oregon, I see these little sheds, I think, what is that? I guess, it, I, don't, I don't think much about it. I think it must be, I don't know, tractors are in there, or hay, it's these factory farms, it's chickens probably, and pigs. And because most of us really are humane people, there's a few psychopaths, maybe two or three percent in the human population, but most of us really are decent, caring, loving people. And we wouldn't do these things, you know, if, we, if it was on our watch, if we really could see it. So that's why they have to hide it, right? And they do a good job. So this psychologist, Melanie Joy, has a good talk online and, and a good book called Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. And she says, 
we have a, th a belief system called carnism. She's labeled it. We have to believe that eating animal foods is normal, natural, and necessary. And then we say, well, we, you know, we've got to do it. You know, we just, you know, I won't look, but we've got to do it. But so she refutes each of those myths that says it's not normal, it's not natural, it's not necessary. If you read her book or watch her talk, I recommend it. Social psychology, by the way, is my master's degree. <laughs> I was in a PhD program myself. Yeah. So here's a guy from that movie Mad Cowboy just saying, you've got to understand, you know, we have to be speaking for these animals. They can't talk. You know, they can't, they're all locked up anyway, even if they could. It's, it's like the concentration camps in World War II for the Jews, but it's a lot bigger numbers. And it's sort of speciesism to think, you know, well, they're just animals. They don't suffer as much as we do. Well, you know, a lot of things were turned around. A special sounds good, but can I uh, substitute the pork chop for a fried chunk of your left butt? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, maybe it will be that way someday, karmically, who knows, you know, <laughs> who knows. So, then there's the question of humane slaughter. If you do it yourself, and you're, you're able to do it, and you can do it as kindly as possible, I commend you, I do, you know, I think then you can eat meat, if you, if it's, if you can solve the other problems. Otherwise, you know, it's nearly always done in not a very good, nice way, and... In any case, animals want to live. You know, they have families. And Howard Lyman, who's you know been responsible for the death of thousands and thousands of cattle raising them, he says kindness before killing them as an answer is totally wrong. If you watch this movie, Mad Cowboy, online free, he's just the most gentle big guy. You know, just like <laughs> he he really speaks well. And living as a total vegan gives me great joy, knowing that no animal has to die for me to live. I mean, so it's sort of a gift we've been given from the universe. We don't really have to do it. It seems. And if you think you do, I would say maybe just look a little deeper. Some people, you know, if you're having trouble, look, what's the problem? You're not getting enough calories. You know, maybe you need the carnitine, whatever. Finally, there's one other piece to this decision that you might want to consider. That's Will Tuttle. In the, he covers all these different topics quite well. But he says one of the gifts of all this is that, that it's a revolution of joy, love, and peace to which we're being called. Fortunately, we, we can do well on these kind of diets. It's kind of a gift, you know. And just perhaps in the past, people thought they needed to enslave animals and want to hunt them and all this. Maybe that was true, you know, at times. But now it's the other way around. The sooner we awaken from the idea, the obsolete idea that we're predatory by nature, the sooner we'll be able to evolve spiritually and discover and fulfill our purpose on Earth. And he believes that we are actually picking up the vibes. And as energetic practitioners, you should be able to relate to this, we're actually picking up the vibes or the energy fields, the vison, or whatever you want to call it, in the animal foods and who've been going through all this suffering. And I actually was talking to somebody who had been Buddhist, who'd been vegetarian, then a doctor, a lot of acupuncturists say, hey, you gotta eat meat. So she did. And I showed her some of this stuff. She watched Cowspiracy. She decided to go back and she said, you know, I noticed that when I ate meat, I got kind of agitated and nervous feeling. And then somebody we're about to show you in a minute noticed with animal behavior problems really quiet down a lot on a vegan diet. That's interesting. They get the worst of it, of course. Okay, now I invite you, this is a positive part, to just imagine for a moment. Imagine what we could create. Why not? And we expect you guys to consider being leaders on this because you've been leaders on homeopathy. You're leaders on caring about animals. You're leaders on doing things right, and you influence a lot of people. Just consider this. Just imagine, imagine a new earth. If a lot of us, you know, ate a plant-based diet, in, in Taiwan they've got 10% of people to vow to do that. It's pretty good. And they say when 10% of a population holds an idea, a moral idea strongly, it, it start, it, that's when social change happens. <laughs> we can love all animals as they deserve. <laughs> Imagine the world. We can let animals love each other and enjoy life with each other in their own sovereign worlds. There but for the grace of God go I, is how I look at this. And then we could end both obesity and starvation. We could actually return a lot of land to nature and let forests and grasslands and whatnot reestablish. I think that's cool. Stabilize our climate with reduced methane and CO2 emissions, I mean, along with some other things, right? We could help restore the ocean, which is dying now. The coral reefs particularly are hit by the effluent from factory farms that come down like the Mississippi. There's a whole big dead zone in the Gulf from too much nitrogen, which causes algal overgrowth and eutrophication in the water. Doing the same thing to a lot of coral reefs. 
In any case, I don't think we have much choice. As our numbers grow, we continue to destroy the Earth's ecosystems with our way of eating. Are we going to have much choice? The sooner we do it, it will be so much infinitely easier for everybody, for the current beings and for ecosystems on Earth, and we have a lot better chance of getting through this in a reasonable way. If you want to consider this, or if you've already been doing it, this is what we recommend now, for people first, because people have the most impact. Okay, so this is a postcard. This is basically the diet that Brenda Davis, vegan nutritionist, recommends. She takes about half the plate, fills it with fruits, and a little bit more vegetables. This is grains, and, and here's legumes. You can just use peas, you know, or edamame, or garbanzos, or kidney beans, or tofu, or... Um, lentils or dal make this really good and a little bit of nuts you don't want too much fat this is corn here so I could, you could take a frozen corn just put it out in the salad bar kind of like, that's what we do we do a lot of little glass containers of salad bar items like this and then we just that's one of our lunches is just to mix all that stuff up so it's important to get a variety green smoothies are good avocados or if you feel like you want some fat it's important if you're craving something, to identify what it is you're craving. Are you craving something creamy, crunchy, salty, you know, a certain texture? And then try to find a substitute for that, and that'll help get you through all this. And maybe your body actually, you know, needs something there. We were designed to crave salt and sugar because they were rare in evolution. And so now they're not rare, but we're over-addicted to them because we're set up physiologically to, to woohoo, you know, when we get them. We've been doing a lot of grain salads and things like with quinoa, millet, and I'll take, make a little Asian dressing and put a lot of chopped raw vegetables like bell peppers and stuff in it. It's really good, grain salads. Uh, avoid the white flour commercial baked goods. Uh, that kind of goes without saying. That's the truth that's in you know, books like Wheat Belly. Flavor with tamari, nutritional yeast, you know, gavi, rice vinegar, all those things kind of help. Whoa! <laughs> I just fast forwarded into the year 2022 seven years after giving this talk and now reconstructing it from my slides and the audio recording. And I just wanted to add that since then, I've made a number of videos on vegan eating and reasons to do it. And go check out my YouTube channel, Susan Pitcairn, and you'll find a really good video on how to make tasty, healthy vegan meals. It makes all the difference. And also this two-page handout you'll find really useful. It has lots of sauces, and recipes in a very concise manner, some of my favorite stuff. All right, back to the past and the rest of the presentation. You know, there were some nice things about those times before 2020, weren't there? I recommend that you take 500 milligrams a day of omega-3 thing, like a DHA. Ovega-3 is a good brand. Ovega-3 is an, an algae-sourced DHA and EPA, and so it gives you the same thing that fish give you, which is to say, a third of your brain, okay, it's DHA. And some vegans are getting too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3 because, because you're eating more grains. And so it's the ratio that matters because they compete for nutrients that help your body manufacture DHA and, e and EFA. So I think, especially if you can't remember what I just said, take the DHA. You know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> or you didn't get that, you know? So it's like, take it. You know, it's an omega-3, like omega-3, omega-3. It tastes good, too, and you're not killing any fish. You can also, by the way, for your omega-3s, get a lot of walnuts, flax, and you've got to grind the flax. You can't digest it otherwise, flax seeds, and, and keep it a few days. The flax will keep for years on the shelf, but you have to grind it to make it available. And so like every week or so, we do some. You put it on our morning cereal. Iodine uh, can be a little deficient. But you can either take a multiple you know, or take some kelp tablets. B12 is sublingual is best. I said that before micrograms, a little spray of B12. You don't have to be religious about it. Tastes good. Kind makes a, a nice vegan one. And methylcobalamin is the kind you want. Now again, on the habitual cravings for meat and dairy, I, I said this before, but just look, go for things like portobellos, avocados, nuts, tofu. I've got some recipes of vegan dairy and meat substitutes, which I think you'd find really handy if you, you can work them right into your current recipes if you'd like to cook. And so here those are. This is a favorite of ours, a carrot cheese sauce. It's basically about half cashews, half cooked carrots, and some lemon and nutritional yeast and you know, seasonings and stuff. And it, it's, it's really good, like if you take some broccoli or something and you steam it up and you just put that over it and mix it in. It's like a cheese sauce on it. And then serve it over rice or something. Or put it in a wrap. 
The nut milk, it's really easy to make. Richard makes soy milk. The sour cream variants are terrific. This is, I think, thank the McDougalls for this. So basically, the, you, there's a simple one. You use silken tofu, lemon, and salt. You can kind of yogurtize it with more lemon and a little bit of maybe sweetening, or you can make it more like a dip with seasonings. Can you use a stevia versus the silage? Sure, sure. Any sweetening that you like. I should say on honey, if you want to do this for ethical reasons, that I, I've just learned more about the honey thing, and it, it's pretty mean to the bees, actually. So agave, if you like something similar, is, is probably a good choice. So here's some meat substitutes, the tofu crumbles. I've, I've made these for years. It just Maybe not the healthiest thing, because I saute them in olive oil but with garlic and stuff, but they're like hamburgers. So I put them in spaghetti sauce. I've got a lot of raves from meat eaters on my spaghetti sauce. Some of you may have had it. A tofu chicken thing, like if you like chicken on a salad kind of thing, you can make uh, little like, rectangles of it, you know, about like a finger size, and just dip it in some vinegar stuff and tamari and, and coat it with yeast and, and then either saute it or bake it. And it's just good cold, too, like cold chicken kind of it reminds me of that. Uh, tofu nut loaf has been a favorite at the holidays. It's got a lot of sage in it. It's kind of like a dressing. This is a new one we learned recently. It's like a meat loaf, and it basically it's, most of these are based a lot on oats, and, and you don't have to use the breadcrumbs, but, or you could use gluten-free seasonings, and then like, there's lots of ketchup or barbecue sauce in this one. That's quite a good party thing. For a sandwich, you can use uh, thin-sliced wild wood savory tofu, or uh, there's also fake and bacon tempa and things like that. You can make some really tasty sandwiches, or you can also use a portobello burger for a burger. If you toast the bun, it helps it be a lot tastier. Yeah? I remember hearing at some point something about soy and thyroid. Or... I think a lot of that's been debunked, but I've looked into it a little bit. There's some very strong anti-soy people, mostly on the Weston Price Foundation site. And I've heard from from Vikoff that, that that is funded by the meat and dairy industry. I just love looking into it. But I heard this thing about soy was not good for health and so on. It had estrogen kind of factors in it and so on. So, I, so briefly, I went on and did some research online and found some reports where um, apparently there's a book, a major book about it, and um, what they said was the information book wasn't right, that that's not the way the Asians actually ate, but they, they used uh, uh, soy products that weren't fermented at, at, a, at a high level. And then they, the other thing was that they found that the estrogen in milk is like a hundred times more than soy, and they're not even sure if they're even biologically active, but in milk, there is an estrogen factor that they say causes the calf to grow. And yeah, and then bovine ho- growth hormone. Dr. Clapper has a, and Dr. McDougall will have, have a lot of things to say about what's in dairy if you look at their stuff online. Are you saying all those uh, soy burgers are non? Well, I would be very careful. There's one brand. There was a few brands that are good. Hillary's Eat Well Burgers are a good one. It has quinoa and millet and stuff in it. Doesn't even have soy in it. It's tasty. And then Wildwood Tofu is a good one. It's all organic. But I would avoid Boca Burgers. They they are not organic. Or Morning Star. They're tasty, but they're not organic. So they probably have GMOs GMO. and, and Roundup and stuff in them, you know. Yeah. Are so. you paying attention to any of the sodium in these recipes? Because, like, that meat level is high. No, you could. You can always put in low-sodium salt substitutes if you're concerned about that. Yeah, that's in the McDougall book. I, don't, I, don't, I can't speak to that too much. I'm sorry. I don't feel expert enough on that. Yeah. Morning Star and what was the other one you didn't like? Boca Burgers I wouldn't get. I would say just the only ones I know to get, unless it's different regionally, would be products by Wildwood. Wildwood. And then their tofu is good too. And Hillary, she's got somebody that had a gluten sensitivity, so she's developed a whole line of products that's all organic. Hillary's Eat Well, their burgers and stuff like that. The, the The faux meats for the holidays, like fake turkey and stuff, they tend to be high in gluten. They're tasty, but they tend to be high in gluten. Maybe just once a year, you know. Okay, now we get to foods for dogs and cats. Ooh, woof, woof. Okay. All right, well, let's look first of all. What's in, we, we all know, just a little reminder, what is in dog food? Well, we're comparing. Okay, euthanized pets, complete with collars and euthanasia solution. You know, what, you think there could be some mad dog disease going on here? I, I, I don't know. And then expired meats, complete with packaging. Styrofoam containers. This is what some of your clients have been eating. You know, you probably know this, but it helps to visualize it. Rejected 4D meats, diseased flesh of the dead, dying, disease disabled. Feathers, beaks, feet, lots more. This is the protein source in a lot of this. It's not the net usable protein. It just qualifies as crude protein, and so that gets them by the AFCO standards. 
Okay, so the health hazards of commercial foods also include rejected rancid moldy grains. Now think about that. Some pets are allergic, like us. Probably have, they have more reason to be allergic to grains than we do because they give them moldy grains. They give them rejected bakery products, you know, expired stuff. And then, you know, they're not going to get organic usually. Synthetic vitamins, you know, there's questions about a lot of that. There's heavy metals and some of that stuff. Oh, then you get leg bands, you know, for the chickens and stuff in the pet food. Good stuff. <laughs> okay. This is a... This woman here, she's a funny kind of out there vegan, but she has some great videos. This is a picture that she made of all the good stuff in pet food, wholesome pet food. So veterinarians are supposed to say, don't feed home prepared diets to your pet. Feed commercial kibbles, you know. Here's what we hear from people. Now we're new to this, okay? And we don't, and Richard's not in practice, and we don't have an animal. So we have to go on what other people say and what you find too. So we'll discuss that in a minute, what you've, any of you may have found. But what we hear, what Will Tuttle's been in this business, so to speak, for 20 years, says he hears that virtually all dogs do well on vegan diets if they're properly planned. With, you gotta add carnitine, taurine, and some healthy supplements, which we'll go into in a minute. About two thirds of cats, he says, can do well. The risks seem to be when they're older, when they're more male and have urinary problems. Arachidonic acid, I think I spelled that wrong. Uh, is a key, according to the founders of, of, the, of this vegan pet supplement line called VeggiePet. They have all this stuff, they worked it out through the years in the Veggie Cat supplement, and you've got to use that. If you do dogs, you can just add human carnitine and taurine, we'll go into that. You don't necessarily have to use theirs. The world's oldest dog was a vegetarian, 26 years old, interesting, huh? And, th you know, we talked about how herbivores can live longer, it seems like. Our mighty May DVM, in LA is, is a vegan veterinarian that has some videos on it. Her videos tend to be kind of cautionary because she doesn't want it to get a bad name. So she cause starts out with all the things you gotta be careful about, especially for cats. So a simple principle is fresh, you know, done a wisely fresh-based diet, just like for us. I mean, we wouldn't want to eat grape nuts every day, right? Even if it was all new balanced and everything. And that said, although there are a lot of really positive reviews of, of vegan kibbles online, of animals getting over skin allergies, particularly and ear problems and the runny eyes and, and behavior problems and a lot of stuff. So, so don't be too worried about that. Just not long ago, we found this video online by a woman in Ukiah, California named Jan Allegretti, really intelligent person. She's worked with vegan diets for some years. She's an ethical vegan and knows a lot about health. And she advocates, you know, by far the fresh food diet. I would watch her video before you get into this. She just basically feeds her dog. She has a great Dane. She's raised at age 13, healthfully, on her own food. Here, okay, now we have this handout here to pass out. This is a summary of all this for the, for the animals. I managed to get it on one page. I'm, I'm really surprised that I could. But she made it really simple. Instead of having a thousand recipes, that are all worked out like we used to do with all the nutrients. I'm trusting her on this somewhat because somebody who raises a Great Dane to age 13, she's done her homework. So, so basically, this is what the program is. And you know, you do higher amounts for cats, like 30 to 60 percent kind of proteiny foods. She says well cooked, so they're mushy. Beans or lentils, like red lentils are particularly good. They get real mushy. Or tofu if you're in a hurry. Tempo, nut butter, split peas. You can just share your own meals. Split peas are good. This is increase the protein proportion for cats and mothers and young and so on. Okay. And then about 30 to 60 percent whole grains and starchy foods like cooked or raw oats, well cooked brown rice, quinoa, barley, potatoes, winter squash, polenta, whole grain bread. We collaborated with her on all this. So she approved all this, as did the, the founders of Veggie Pet, who've been at it for 25 years. Now, she, for her dog, at least, she does 10 to 30% vegetables and fruits. So veggie pet people say they don't think cats really need that. I leave that to you. Some cats really do love cucumbers and cantaloupe and stuff, and then they'll attack them. We even read a story in this vegetarian pet food book about a lion that chose vegan food over meat when it was offered to it. A lion. Interesting, huh? That's, that's in the book, uh, Vegetarian. You know, let's see, Dogs and Cats Go Vegetarian, I think. It's, talk to me later about it. It's kind of gone through some different editions and has different titles, but by, by James Peden, P-E-D-E-N. Okay, so the vegetables and fruits. So she, her, she's a, her, dog, her great Dane here just loves, you know, like all, all kinds of raw stuff. And she's herself been eating more and more raw kale, you know, carrot, like maybe lightly steamed raw carrots, raw broccoli, raw cauliflower, he eats all that, apples, tomatoes, loves strawberries, uh, citrus, 
you know, cucumber, all this, you know, whatever she's eating. But just you've got to avoid onions, grapes, raisins, or chocolate, since they don't do well with those. Okay, fats. She adds a one to three teaspoons, you know, depending on the size, a day of flax, olive, coconut, or hemp oil, or ground flax seeds, or you could use veggie pets, <coughs> green mush, which has a lot of vegan DHA in it. For it now, she says this is essential, essential amino acids. These are the ones for dogs. She adds carnitine and taurine. She just adjusts the label amount proportionate to its size, you know, compared to the human label. She just uses human products. For cats, she always use, would always say use Veggie Pet because they've got a number of things in there. Cats are, you know, are truly carn full carnivores or you risk the serious problems. So then she says, okay, she uses human grade vitamin mineral supplement. She says you don't have to put all this calcium in there like you did you know, with the, when you have a lot of meat because the phosphorus calcium ratio is, is, is okay. And you know, if she's got a big dog with good bones, I, I think that says something. So, and she's seen lots and lots of dogs do well on this. Okay. So, so she, she adds just a variety of stuff. Like she, I would suggest New Chapter as a brand that has, um, it's food-based, it's organic, and it's vegan. And it's not real high levels, you know, of vitamins that are imbalancing. It's just like maybe six to ten milligrams of the B vitamins. Susan, they were bought by somebody. Yeah. Oh, were they? Not as they're good not as they ladies. were. Okay. Like I quit using them. Oh, yeah? There's another one called Mega Food that um, is taking their place. Yeah, that's another one. I, I'm, not, I'm, not sure it's I'm not sure it's vegan. I didn't know that. A lot of these are getting taken over, yeah. yeah. So, Mega Foods. Yeah, mega <laughs> but it's still probably better than a lot of them. <laughs> She suggests using a variety of probiotics, like we talked about for p humans. She, she'll throw in some spirulina, which has a lot of the, I think the DHA and the blue-green algae, nutritional yeast, wheat germ, alfalfa, le organic lecithin, and so on. Just, you know, she just kind of throws a lot of th things in as she eats them, kind of. It's not like religious, like X amount per day. And then if, the, the stu if stuff's come in through the stool and there's undigested pieces, she sprinkles, has them sprinkle Veggie Pets, Prozyme Plus, or it's not, they're sold by Veggie Pet, Prozyme Plus on before serving. We have some here if anybody wants to, that's open if anybody wants some on their food, by the way. Uh, it really helps some animals, she says it, and then Veggie Pet people thought that was important too. But their digestion often does improve as their bodies adapt, and, and we know now that dogs are not the same thing as wolves, really. They have developed amylase to, to digest greens. Richard, you have looked into that a bit. Yeah, I looked into that too. This, you can hear that statement that, well, uh, wolves and dogs don't have amylase in their saliva, which is true. They do actually have some, it's not very much. <laughs> but what's not said is that they have it throughout their intestinal tract. <laughs> so it's not like they're devoid of it. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting thing is, uh, related to that, is the article that came out in the Nature Journal a few months, or maybe a month or so ago. Did you hear about that? Nature is a very respected journal. If you don't know that one, it's like as a scientific journal, it's up there with science journal and so on. Well, these uh, uh, scientists did a sequence of the dog, domestic dog genome, and found that as a result of domestication, that they've activated several genes that uh, enable them to digest starch very efficiently. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> and there are a lot of stories. Sorry. There are a lot of stories online of animals that seem to prefer these kind of foods to when they're offered meat or something. I mean, not, not always, you know. And there's stories actually of, of cats even that are eating vegan diets that still hunt, but they don't eat the prey when they catch it. Go back here. Okay, so kibbles. Okay, if you want to try it, you just don't have time. Or for backup, what, what, what uh, Jan Allegretti does is about every month or so, she's busy and she uses kibble. It's a backup food or maybe to add a little crunch or something. And, and we have some free samples here of some, of what seems like a good, affordable, natural balanced vegetarian dog kibble. It's all vegan. And it, it's basically just oat, potatoes, barley, and things like that. It tastes pretty good. It tastes kind of like a, kind of a high fiber cookie. Yeah, I, I tasted it. I would never taste dog food before this. <laughs> and so, and it's a little cheaper, but if you really want to go top of the line, I think I'd consider V-Dog, which I'll show you in a minute, because that's a vegetarian, a vegan company. Okay, here's the natural balance stuff. We have some samples. Please take some if you like. And see, look, the reviews are good. Got 135 reviews, four and a half star average. And it's 18% crude protein, which is not as high as the, the other, the V-Dog one. The ingredients are, you know, brown rice, oatmeal, barley, peas. Peas are a good protein source, and they're really good in vegan mayos, by the way. Um, canola, da da da, yeah. So it's got a lot of different, new, you know, vitamins and minerals here. B12, 
so on. Okay, here's some reviews. Okay, God, they, they've tried a bunch of stuff. They all agree that's the best. My oldest dog seriously thrived, energetic, happy. Their coats look so shiny, and their nasty dog breath has gone away. And this is the one where I got the, about the world's oldest living dog, and I saw that elsewhere, but it was vegan. And then here's one, the beagle. Uh, he would often vomit after eating when he ate an Omni diet and have digestive issues, and even the high-end food with meat in it. Okay, his weight has easier to manage, nicer coat, better smelling breath. His, his vet visits have been great. I totally recommend this brand. So here's another one talking about allergies. Five Star, found at Petco. Ever since he went to it, he's been basically allergy free, like a whole different dog. Clear eyes, clear skin, lost a bunch of weight, runs around with his brother like they were puppies again, doesn't smell, hasn't needed to go back to the vet for his ears. My dog, he loves his food, and love, I love that he's finally healthy. So that's just a boxer, had a lot of yeast infections, stinky dog problems, and so on. Big ear washing, five stars. This is the V-Dog, and this is what Will Tuttle thought was the best one. And it's got fewer reviews, only 25, but they've probably not used it. But see, it's more expensive. It's 265 a pound, and if you've got it, that's including the shipping on Amazon, but you can get it directly from them for less, like $2 a pound if you get it directly from their website, V-Dog.com. And I think they, it's in some retail stores, but they've had some trouble. Okay, it starts with dried peas, brown rice, so it's higher in peas. Pea protein concentrate, oil, excuse me, oats, lentils, can, canola oil again. They don't really say that that's organic either. You know, quinoa, millet. Well, you can make your own too, but you know, it's, apparently do dogs are doing well on it. See, this has like 24% protein in it. I don't know if we saw that part yet, but that's coming next. And they, they really avoid gluten and all that. So they're, they're careful about, it says no corn, no wheat, no soy. They do seem to have the canola. And they have some superfoods in there like blueberries and stuff. Okay, we're proud of every ingredient. <laughs> okay, here they are, if you want to photograph that. Okay, some reviews of V-Dog. I was actually very against my dog going vegan at first. Had her on an all-meat, grain-free diet. Interesting. But this stuff is really amazing. Look, this is a chihuahua. Had the gunk under the eyes. The best vet in the area. Said it was seasonal allergies. Put her on daily meds and so on. Ran out of the expensive dog food. Just happened to get it. Has totally cleared up her eyes and made her coat amazingly shiny. I never write reviews, but this stuff is awesome. I'm very health conscious. Before V Dog, I couldn't find any dog food up to my standards. I had to make my own. She was worried at first. I was worried they wouldn't eat it normally because they get home food, cooked food like rice and lentils. Boy, was I wrong. They were so excited. They just scarfed it down, basically. And she's been using it for about a year and they love it. Does didn't say what the sodium content is of that food? Oh, uh, it probably does. You can, you can look it up. Okay, this is the healthiest, highest quality food in the market. I've done a ton of research. Been grossed out, disgusted what I found until I found this one. It's all natural, vegan. My dogs love it. Their systems have never been healthier. They have a lot of energy and shiny coats, fast shipping and so on. Here's another one with chronic ear infections, skin irritations, always itchy, could not digest anything. Our 10th food dry. Vet told me to buy this one. He suffers no more from the ailments listed above. I just want to hug the person that made a vegan kibble available. Thank you with all our hearts. Okay, now, I started running out of time at this point. <laughs> this was like, like this morning. <laughs> My God. Like, and I was looking, God, there must be some other vegan cat foods, you know, but the main ones I'm finding are Evolution and Ami. And Ami's from Italy. They both have good reviews. Just heard people say they've done it successfully. I just have time to completely do my homework on this. If in doubt, if you, you really feel like cats have got to eat meat, then I would suggest you could try diets like in our book if you haven't used those. I mean, you feel more confident about the grain part. But add, you might want to add Prozyme and Veggie Cat for good measure. They've just cut down on those like total meat diets. I don't think you need to do it. Cats aren't that big. They don't eat that much. If you want to get that grass-fed stuff, maybe so. But, you know, the, of course, cats aren't, little cats don't really go hunting cows, you know. So. We should add in, I think, at this point about... Just uh, for your information, the grass-fed option as an attractive option is disappearing. If you're not aware of it, the government has approved the release of GMO pasture grass. Mm. Yeah, puppy, huh? Yeah, isn't it too bad how they're destroying our food supply? Yeah. This is Evolution. I, haven't, I couldn't get a sample in time. It's an all-vegan company. It was founded by a chiropractor, a former chiropractor, who got his license taken away. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good reviews on it. Here they go crazy for it. Um, they ignored the meat-based cat food on the first day and thereafter, eating only the vegetable-based pieces from their bowl. 
and so on. Never known a cat, two cats to be sweeter and more active than these. Again, Jen Allegretti said their behavior problems often go away. They become more peaceful. This is pretty long here. Cat immediately embraced it. It was 15, okay. Well, it, you can read, there's a lot of things on there. Here's the ingredients, and I don't like the ingredients as well, but it says it's not a GMO. Oats, corn, soy, soy, carrots, tomato, potato, molasses, and various supplements, and yeah, I think, yeah, I think they have a canned one too. You know, Richard and I have not had a pet since 2000 when our cat died. <laughs> one of the reasons we don't is we, we've had, we always felt this dilemma about feeding the meat. And so, so some people might someday just choose not to have carnivorous pets, you know, get a rabbit or something instead, or a chicken or whatever, or don't have an animal, have wildlife. I mean, that's, that's kind of where, where we're kind of personally heading. I know you're veterinarians, you know, <laughs> and so was Richard, that's exactly. So. It would, I know, I know. I realize you've got a conflict of interest here. You know, I know it, I know it. <laughs> we're asking you to go all the way, baby. No. <laughs> no. So yeah, this is just a thing I found just like that, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at I love <laughs> the, the the predator and the prey make friends here. Yeah, look at those tongues. Those cows have amazing tongues, and then the cat gives it back. <laughs> Sweet, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? Thank you.